Today's episode is being brought to you by Gem City Fine Foods, dedicated gluten-free and nut-free dessert bakery using only the finest clean ingredients. These desserts are unlike anything you've had before. Gluten-free and in some cases even dairy-free and vegan. You've got to go and check them out at gemcityfinefoods.com. And Fluger's Bacon. Fluger's Bacon, we used them at the World Food Championships. Everybody loved it. You are going to love it. You have got to try this incredible bacon. Find it at flugers.com. Pardon my fork. 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 From Japan. Pardon my fork. 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 Whether you're a home cook, a chef, a restaurateur, or just like to eat, we've got something for everyone. So grab a plate and get an extra helping food for thought and knowledge for life on pardon my fork hello and welcome to pardon my fork this is episode two of season two hun yeah it's good to be here i mean technically last week was not exactly you know what we wanted the the show with don't get me wrong, every week is what I want the show to be, but but it's not the format that we had talked about last week. We're finally starting to get into it, right? Well, last week was like recoup from the World Food Championship, and there was so much that happened there, so much to digest and process through. You know, it, it was a big upset in so many categories, and it was the first year in Dallas, Texas, but... You know, it's November. We're starting to gear up towards Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Also, the flu hit our house really hard. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. If you're hearing a little bit of gravelly in our throats, it's because we both got sick. <laughs> oh, man. You know, bless our nephew, Nicholas. He was here taking care of the ducks and chickens. And he was gone. While we were gone, he got sick. But, you know, he's such a trooper. So shout out to him. We all need those amazing people in our family. But I get back to work and one of the other doctors, he got the flu. And then it's just been getting passed around at work like a really cheap sandwich. So, yeah, it's not going well. Well, that's been one of the nice things, though, about our topic of the week, which is squash, Mm -hmm. because it's kind of the perfect make you feel better warming your soul down home kind of a a veggie, although it's not technically a veggie, it's a fruit. It is technically a fruit. That's true. You know, tomatoes are fruit, squash are fruit. Um, You know, squash is, is one of the earliest and most important domesticated crops in America. I think they have proof of some type of squash cultivation going back to something like 8000 BC, right? Yeah. You know, Mesoamerica... Eastern, Northern Africa, and North America, they've all had native squash that were cultivated by the Native Americans or the Native population that lived there. There was a lot of squash that was domesticated about 10,000 years ago. Um, You know, most common were pumpkins, squash, zucchini, gourds. Mm -hmm. You know, they were used for vessels to carry liquids in. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it was oil or water or wine, but also they, you know, they were a really good, easy, sustainable crop. Squash can, you know, I guess in, in our culinary culture, we have summer squash and we've got winter squash. Summer right. squash are your zucchini, your cooknick squash. Those are probably the two most common ones that everybody's really comfortable with. And you can do a lot of things with those. Um, but then your winter squash is going to be more of your gourds, your pumpkins. We are really rocking the delicata squash in our garden this year. Um, my sister brought back an organic non-GMO squash from the Orcas Islands when she was there celebrating her anniversary. And so we just saved the seeds. Mm -hmm. So it's not a hybrid squash. So I wasn't really worried about some weird squash coming out. And they're such a delicious delicata squash. It's the sunshine delicata, which normally uh, people think they're green. 
and um, delicata can be orange. Mm-hmm. We, have, we have kabocha squash. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sunshine kabocha, and so that one's orange, but a lot of times they come green. And both of those, by the way, thin enough skin to where you can you can eat the whole thing. Yeah, you and totally I was can. surprised by that. Yeah, we're and our neighbors they're growing spaghetti squash, which lots of people have had spaghetti squash. I think there's a, kind of a polarizing opinion about whether or not spaghetti squash is a really good substitute for spaghetti. I, I'm i more in the, I don't think that a marinara sauce goes great on spaghetti squash. No, no. It was, I, a matter I just of fact, don't think so. We have a zoodler. Uh, which is, you know, you make the zucchini noodles and I don't really like those. I don't like them either. We've done them a couple of different ways. So the first time we tried it, we just spiralized the the zucchini just mm-hmm. raw, right? right? And then we poured the sauce over it. And of course, a ton of liquid came out. It just turned into this sloppy mess. Yeah. But then, of course, the more labor intensive way of making zoodles is, you know, you spiralize them mm-hmm. and then you wrap them in. A lot of people say cheesecloth. I'm not actually a fan of the cheesecloth. I think like a like a terry cloth dish rag mm-hmm. or something like that, you know, wrap them in that and then squeeze them out really, really hard, really, really tight. Get as much of that liquid out as you possibly can. And uh, oh, sorry. No, before you do that, you salt, salt them. Yeah, you salt them, get as much of that liquid to come out. It gives you a much firmer product, which doesn't get soggy when you put a sauce over the top of it. But to be honest with you, I'm still just not a fan of the taste. I'm not either. I'm not either. You know, uh, zucchini and crookneck squash, I kind of like it just grilled or sauteed with some butter and salt and pepper. Like, pretty, Mm -hmm. pretty basic. You make a fantastic zucchini relish as well. Yeah, I got that from your mother, actually. So thank you to mom for her recipe. It's nice because it's got a different flavor and a different texture, different consistency from pickle relish, you know? It does. And, you know, it's we're headed towards Thanksgiving. So common squashes that are served, you know, you get your pumpkin pie. Some people do sweet potato pie. Butternut squash, acorn squash are really common. I grew up with either one of those that have been cut in half, scooped out, roasted with brown sugar, cinnamon, salt, and butter. That's really, really common. What I have had that's been an interesting thing is to do a soup inside a squash. Mm -hmm. So you make like a nice hearty soup with like wild rice and chicken and, you know, you're sort of fall poultry seasonings, your sage, thyme, rosemary, and you make the soup, but then you put it in a pumpkin, you put the lid on and you bake it, the mm-hmm. whole pumpkin, and then you serve it. And you could do that with a delicata squash. You could probably do it with a Hubbard. You could probably do it with a kabocha squash. Anything that it's a little bit harder squash, you can scoop it out. There's a, there's a a bowl inside and it's a dramatic way to serve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a Eastern European New Year's dish or wedding dish that we learned about where you take white rice, dried fruit, honey, and melted butter, and you fill the pumpkin up with that mixture and then you roast it in a, um, a pit oven. So those are, that's a really dramatic way to present sort of a sweet a celebratory pumpkin dish or squash mm-hmm. dish, whichever is common in your family. I talked about that dish, as a matter of fact, a little bit with Chef Chris now. Yeah. And we had a pretty good time talking. He mm-hmm. gave me a few recipes and a few thoughts. Why don't I go ahead and cue that up now? Chef, how are we? Doing really good. Really good. Excited to be on the show this morning. I appreciate that, man. And of course, it's squash week and squash means something I feel like to us Pacific Northwesterners, because uh, squash just grows really, really well here. Totally, totally. I agree. I actually have a rogue pumpkin that I've been nursing in my yard. I I mean, it, in some ways, it can almost grow all on its own without any sort of aid, because I have about a 24-inch bright green pumpkin sitting right here that I, I did not plant in my yard. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yes. We have kaboka squash going this year, and I've really been enjoying it. But, man, talk about not needing to do anything to it. Like, seriously, we put some uh, chicken bedding in our garden, you know, early this year, and the squash is just growing like crazy, and it's so sweet, and it's so delicious. I, I was just shocked. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
We've been doing a lot with it, my friend. Uh, I had some photos out, and uh, I, I'll have to actually make sure to tag you in some of these photos. But I made a meatloaf yesterday that had some of that roasted kabocha squash that was diced and put into it. So the meatloaf was a mixture of buffalo and pork, and it has uh, duck eggs for a binder, obviously, mushrooms, uh, the baby crimini mushrooms, onions, and again, that squash that's diced up. And it brings this nice, almost a sweetness to it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so with that in mind, why don't you share with us a few of the uses that you'd have for, for a seasonal squash? Well, definitely for me, I think seasonal squash is really interesting um, when it comes to uh, all the varietals that have great, beautiful colors. There's um, a mess of different skin types when it comes to squash. And I think that like, that's the biggest thing when you're trying out new varietals of squash is some of them look alike and some of them look radically different than maybe a pumpkin or a zucchini you're used to. I mean, there's so many different varietals and you always have to take into consideration whether the skin is going to be edible and become part of your dish. And sadly enough, I find that some of the most beautiful looking squash, the, the skin that makes them look so beautiful typically has little or no culinary value or it's so woody, it's completely inedible. So I think that's like my favorite part about squash and, and learning new ones is kind of just taking a whole one and popping it in the oven whenever I come across a new squash. You know, typically with squash, it's a minimalist process of, of transforming a squash into a good meal. You might have to do as little as cut it in half and take the seeds out, or in some cases, just throw it in the oven whole. So I, I think that um, when it comes to squash recipes seasonally, like here in the fall, I really like that bold look of like a fully split piece of squash just so bold and looking like it's fresh out of the garden now roasted on the plate and i know for some people maybe they uh maybe they would prefer food that doesn't look so much like where it came from but uh that's that's definitely my favorite part about squash is trying to get as many different colors and textures into your diet as possible i think that that's the most exciting part and for me i i, I think one of my favorite squash is probably the pumpkin i i Actually, one day I've told my wife, I want to own a pumpkin patch one day because I love pumpkins so much. No kidding. I actually was just in um, Dallas for the World Food Championship and had the, the great chance to go to the Dallas Arboretum. And I saw more pumpkin and squash varieties than I think I've ever seen in my life. It might be like 150 varieties or something crazy. I got a two minute video on my Instagram if you want to check it out later, Andy. It's pretty cool. Yeah. But I, I think that out of all the the squash is, I, I think pumpkin's still king for me personally. How about you? What, what's your favorite? You know, it's hard for me because I love the butternut squash. I love the acorn squash. These uh, kaboka squash that we've been growing, it's a very new varietal to me. But like you were saying, it's one that you can eat the skin of. And so I've really been enjoying that, just roasting it whole and eating the whole thing. And, you know, off air, we were kind of talking about the... I don't know the fun of cooking inside of a pumpkin because you can't necessarily eat the skin of a pumpkin. It's a little too woody or tough, but it becomes yes. the perfect cooking vessel for putting stuff in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of fun because it adds, I feel like that rustic element, if you can put it on the table whole, I just think that that's so fun. Like, if you're having a sit down meal where the guests are, aren't seeing it and you're able to like bring the plate out or the guests are coming up to a banquet that, you know, you're having everyone come and mingle and they get to come by the appetizer table for a fall before Thanksgiving type of thing, a pre football kind of thing. I just think how fun it is to see a whole pumpkin <laughs> right there in the <laughs> yeah. middle of the table. It's, it's sort of fun. It's kind of adds to that like surrealism element of food that I really like. Um, kind of delivering on look at what we've conquered we've like taken this beautiful thing from nature and like transformed it into something you now get to consume i, I think that that's the fun thing about like whole pumpkin whole squash dishes and it feels really ancestral i think that that's another really cool element kind of like when you're like going at a whole fish or just any kind of whole animal that's on the table and, and it has like that 
real like tribal feeling that you know is i think ubiquitous with the season and you know why thanksgiving is so attractive to us as a, as a family meal yeah you know what that's a really good point actually and like you said there's just something so ubiquitous about it it makes me wonder sometimes if squash was a more important part of our our diet at some point in history because like you said there's just something so attractive about seeing that whole squash that whole pumpkin you know sitting on the table it's almost like you know you start salivating when you see it before you even know what's going on with it there's something ubiquitous about seeing a pumpkin and knowing it's there for the flavor although i i feel like there's not been i don't know the pumpkin's not really been getting its due recently if you know what i mean do you have any recipes that you like to cook with pumpkin that you think are really overlooked well for me i think pumpkin is really good in international flavors in ways you wouldn't think you know, um, when I think of continental America's like Mexican things that come to mind would be like a pumpkin empanada. You know, those are like your sweet dishes. But then I think another really cool international and savory uh, way to use pumpkin is in curries. I've, I've had a lot of different types of Indian curried pumpkin. I, I really like a uh, even like a Thai coconut milk, like a green and coconut milk type pumpkin where the orange gets to show through the color of the dish and not just be like this big orange bowl of puree, which is I think what most people think of when they think of like a, a pumpkin stew. You know, you think of a pumpkin stew, you probably think of like this bowl of hot orange liquid. And so I think that that's one of my favorites is like Indian pumpkin as well as Mexican pumpkin, you know, that's, that's my ancestral flavor profile. So I, I think that like anything with spice and chilies and clove coming together with all squashes that they're really, um, what is it? They're, they're fibrous in the nature of their flesh and they absorb flavor so well. So like, that's the fun thing with squash is no matter whether you're going to chilies or to herbs or even just like salt, pepper, and sugar to let the pumpkin or the squash's flavor shown through that those those stringy fibers of all those squash are really ready to absorb any flavor with water or fat as a medium. So I think that's that's another good part about it. Like my, my favorite thing is is obviously Indian, but I think that you can infuse so many flavors into a squash and really make it unique. Mm, mm -hmm. So you go far beyond just the cinnamon, nutmeg, brown sugar over an acorn squash. I mean, you're really you're, you're what you're talking about is a marriage of, of sweet and savory with uh, a lot of these dishes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I find that when I when I do squash, I like to I don't know, I, I like to sneak a little curry powder into a lot of flavors that aren't necessarily Indian. I'll even put a dash of curry powder in my pumpkin pie, as well as um, I really like pickling spice, too. When you when you take pickling spices and you grind them in your spice or coffee grinder, um, I, I have like a like a mulling pickling spice blend I, I keep on my shelf here at home. And that's kind of something I use in tandem with curry. And um you can you can use curries in a real minimalist way. You know, when you use curry, it doesn't have to be this this bold in your face flavor. It can be that mild, mellow sort of seasonal spice that uh, that makes people go, "Ooh, what did you use this time?" Um, and you, you know, you don't have to just use nutmeg and cinnamon. It's I think that might be one of the things people are slowly getting bored of when it comes to the to the pumpkin realm of dishes. Is you know, there's other there's other aromatic and spice uh, pairings that enhance the flavors even better. Mm, I love that, man. And, you know, you've got me thinking about places where we could substitute squash for other traditional dishes just to just to shake it up a little bit, you know. And so I'm sitting here thinking maybe for Thanksgiving this year, instead of doing mashed potatoes, maybe I'll just roast up some of these like a like a delicata squash maybe i'll roast that up and try to puree that down and see if i can make a, a mash out of that oh that would be fun yeah absolutely i would think that that would be really fun if you uh if you brought a little bit more fat into the and then like instead of just using butter you could use like mascarpone or like goat cheese i also think that mm. would be like That'd be like sexy sounding to your guests. It's like we have the the squash mascarpone mash instead of a traditional potato or sweet. I think that yeah, totally, mm. totally, Andy. Interesting. Okay, and for our our vegan and vegetarian listeners, I 
there's there's another component here. I feel like in America, we kind of overlook the squash as something that can replace, I don't know, certain elements in a dish texturally, if you know what I mean. Yeah, sure. Sure. Absolutely. How it has that uh, sort of peel away fiber, similar to how in spaghetti squash, it can be used as spaghetti. It could be used as a pasta. It could be used as a as a meat replacement or um, it can seem a lot more like your starchy potato. Totally. Yeah, exactly. I find that I, and I could be way off base. You'll have to back me up here, chef, if you can. But something like a butternut yeah. squash, when a butternut squash is kind of cooked al dente, it r- has a texture that kind of reminds me of a firm tofu. And I feel like if you're going for that tofu in a dish, why not bring an extra flavor component with something like a par baked butternut squash? Mm hmm. Absolutely. And of course, we can't. We let you go without talking a little bit about presentation. You know, again, we talked about roasting a pumpkin whole and stuffing it with different things. And I know that in the past you and I have talked about, you know, using a roasted acorn squash as a soup bowl or or using it as a presentation dish for, you know, something like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a... There's a cider company here in the Pacific Northwest called Two Town Cider House. And at their harvest party every year, they fill these giant pumpkins with one of their pumpkin ciders. And then they they tap the pumpkin and everything and and they pour right out of those. Do you have any other presentation ideas that you'd like to share with the audience uh, when using these gourds and squash? Sure, sure. You know, I, I, I'm going to go back to saying that it's definitely important to be bold with squash. I mean, you can you can spend a lot of time shaving off the skin and de-seeding it and cutting it into tiny little tidbits. And I find that most often that really takes away from some of the texture. You know, you've got some long stringy cell structures that are occurring in these squash and each one's a little different, but I mean, typically they'll run from, from the end of the stem to the, uh, to the butt of the, of the squash. So, I mean, there's, there's like a really nice like strata of, of, of string that you can, you can really enhance. And I, I find that like if you cut something in half and then from the spine, cut it as if it was wedges of an orange, like radially, you're uh, you're you're getting like big, thick wedges out of it for like pumpkin, uh, even delcata. You typically only have to like quarter a delcata squash. But, um, you know, whether it's um, a um, what is it called? A uh, acorn or a pumpkin you you typically can get like maybe like eight to 12 nice long size shoots out of it and not even have to peel the skin so i typically find that's like the boldest easiest way to get it onto the tray and into the oven for dinner is you're going to want to cut it into like the longest bulkiest chunks and then that also makes them really easy for applying your flavor you know i think that sometimes when you cut them into smaller tidbits and stuff you often will i think over season it i've done this i've done this before and you'll you'll use the same amount of spice that you would on the huge piece on the small little tidbits and it just covers the surface area so much that really takes away from the squash you lose the texture you get too much flavor it almost seems greasier because now the grease has like coated it and so i definitely would say that if people want to try new squash dishes like go bold like do as minimal amount of cutting to it as possible. Leave it nice and chunky. And it's going to also, um, it's going to typically cook the same amount of time, like cutting, cutting squashes usually into really small bits to try and get them to cook faster. It's effective, but really only by, by like shaving like five or 10 minutes off of the cook time. So I definitely would say that for presentation, if you're going to use squash this season, like go bold, leave it whole or leave it really big and, um, you know, keep in mind what size of a piece your guest or yourself is going to want to enjoy. So I might do like somewhere between two to four ounces of squash, like a nice pie slice size piece and just rub, rub it with oil and your spice of choosing and throw it in the oven. I love that, man. I love that. And then if it's too big, you just portion it once it's been cooked so that you don't lose any of that body. Yeah, totally, totally. And I, I think that like um, sometimes when I have a new squash I haven't tried yet, like I just cooked one two days ago. It was a uh, it looks a lot like a delcata and it's called a golden boat. And the difference between the golden boat and the delcata is mainly that the skin is not edible on the golden boat. So it looks 
very similar. That nice golden and uh, like forest green with a creamy color, like brendling together. And um, I, I, when I first picked it up, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. A lot like Delcata. But then when I tested it, I was like, oh, no, it's super woody. So I had to cook them and have boats, just like the name, which made sense. Whoever varietally named that obviously <laughs> gave us a hint into how it would be cooked. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely based on the discernment of what squash you're going to do. But I took that golden bolt squash and peeled one and took the same exact size one and cut it into long slivers looked like steak fries. Hmm. And I took one and I split it in half and left the skin on and baked it. And honestly, the, the one that was split in half, scooping it from the skin and eating the flesh from the, from the boat, it was far more enjoyable than just cutting into some french fry looking yellow and you know you couldn't even tell what it was after it was cooked it it was just squash <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. you lose so I, that I think visual that's, representation that's also the challenge you know the challenge is transforming the dish without making it look indecipherable i i, I think that that's really important for these squash ingredients is like who wants to just eat the same old orange butternut puree and it's like pumpkin in the can at that point like you don't even know that it's really a pumpkin you you know and i I don't know what pumpkin in a can is made out of if it's always pumpkin or if it's kind of like sweet potatoes in the can but it's like it's so indecipherable like something inside you makes you go i mean is this really what i think it is you know when you're being served it obviously if you're cooking it you know what it is but (laughs) i don't know i'm just i'm not trying to turn all of our lovely things from the flora of life into baby food It, it it should be more wow in your face i love that man rustic but not not just like uh, you're not splitting the pumpkin open yourself as a guest, but you can see what it is and that affects because visually it's going to affect the way you taste it and, and the way you eat it. You know, if you don't know that it's squash, you may not be tasting all of the squashy representation, but if you're looking at it, you're going, oh, I know exactly what that is. And you're eating and you're, and you're biting into it, you know, provided you're not one of those people that just looks at something and says, nope, I'm completely turned off by it and I won't do it. <laughs> Totally, totally. And it's kind of like, I don't know, it, for me, I don't eat sweet potatoes a lot, but when I do, they always just trigger me into being like, wow, I really love whole baked sweet potato. Like, it's one of those things that like, I, I, I don't usually grab it and bring it home, but my wife really does. And it always reminds me of my mom. And so like w- when people are um, having a dish like that, that stimulates you into being like, wow, I really love this. I think that that's the kind of thing that you can get when you when you have a whole squash, especially for like, I think, young people to old. It's like every age range gets really excited because it's a seasonal thing. It's a it's a thing that comes only a certain time of the year. So I I just think that it's like, yeah, get rid of the the pureed butternut soups that look like stuff from a package. I don't know how many like soup booths and like bow pack orange liquids. That I think that that's what most people think of when they think of a good pumpkin or squash dish is like, oh, make a bisque or this orange goo. It's like I want to I want to see something that like makes me get excited like a little boy and be like, wow, I really love this. Because I, I think that uh, when I when I think of my first memory of eating pumpkin is like thinking, oh, this is going to be kind of weird and you're going to be eating this thing that we made into like an arts and crafts thing. And if you bite into it raw, <laughs> if you bite into a raw pumpkin, which I know that some of us have probably tasted even more uh, than just the raw skin or flesh or like touching your hands while you're while you're uh, you're carving a pumpkin. It's like I think that most of us that have experienced pumpkin, whether it be as an art form or as a food item, would realize like it doesn't really taste that good before it gets cooked. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not like, a, like, you know, cabbage or apples or any of these other food items. Squashes are kind of disgusting in, in their raw form. And there's a few squashes like, you know, yellow squash and zucchini that can be eaten raw. I, I don't really prefer raw zucchini personally myself or yellow squash, but I think that's like the thing with pumpkin and squash. Like once it's transformed, we kind of realize, wow, this is so good. Mm-hmm. Cause in it's like natural form on the ground before it's cooked. It's like, 
this is a doorstop. <laughs> you know, this is this this doesn't really have much value culinarily or or uh, nutritionally until it is cooked. I mean, in most parts of gourds and squashes. So I think that's kind of the fun part. It's like it's like this transformation that also comes from like a very specific time of the year. I think it, I, it, for me, at least, it makes me like boyishly excited about pumpkin. I mean, that's why I think pumpkin is my favorite one. I'm also just a Halloween kid through and through. Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, I got married on Halloween. Oh, you got married on Halloween, too. So you're the yeah. perfect person to talk about this stuff with. Oh, well, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now, Chris, the insides, you know, not a lot of people save their seeds. Some people do. Some people don't. We're sure. a little bit of a mixed bag in our household. Sometimes we save the, se- the seeds. Sometimes we don't. Uh, the kabocha squash, for example, You know, I tried roasting the seeds and I was not a huge fan, but of course, roasted pumpkin seeds, I'm a huge fan of. Where do you fall on that? Do you like to save your seeds for eating? Do you like to save them for replanting? You know, I do. I I would say that like maybe lately being a chef, I do a lot of high volume. So I have composted a lot of seeds in the last year that it was like, okay, I don't have the two extra hours today to be breaking down gallons of seeds so i think that like you know they're definitely a fun thing to do if you have a group of people to help you like Mm -hmm. if you have your family and you know these are squash that you're either like celebrating seasonally with because they're from your garden or they're part of your harvest meal i think that they're like a really fun group thing um as far as like why um the, the the process of saving the seeds and toasting the seeds is so important it's it's definitely something that goes back to the like the idea of ancestral seed saving. And in most cases, I, I don't I don't know off the top of my head whether most pumpkins in the States are organic, but I I know that most of them are able to be regrown from their seed. So, I mean, in the case of almost all squashes that you find, I think that you can save and dry the seeds. A few of them might, might require to be refrigerated or uh, stored in a certain way for them to actually grow. But uh, from from my, from my knowledge, I'm pretty sure like most squash can be left on the ground and then turn into another squash, similar to the pumpkin growing in my yard. I think it, I think that I just left a pumpkin rotting back there and it somehow grew. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that like for saving the seeds, definitely something fun to do with a group. Like if you have kids or you're uh, some some kind of hip hipsters that like like doing fun <laughs> food things together. I don't know. Um, it's, it's pretty fun, you know, like saving the seeds and toasting them. And then you can get as creative as you want with it. Cause they're pretty much like a late night snack or, uh, or whatever time of day snack. And, uh, I think the coolest thing to do with them is to use them in purees. If, if you can, and they usually have to be de holed and that's a whole crazy amount of work, but some of them, if they're picked at the right part of the season, when you go to toast them, the, the hole might even crack and you can de hole them. It's just, it's a crazy amount of work. Um, for the seeds like papitas that have already been holed, you can, you can buy those at the market. So as, as a chef, I think it's really fun and like part of the relationship of the plant to, if you've never done it before, gather those seeds, toast them up. But as a chef, I mean, I'll go buy a pound of papitas and make a nice papita pesto to go with a pumpkin dish before I sit there and like pull out every seed for an hour and a half. So I think time management goes into it. I'll be honest <laughs> yeah. with everybody. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's very fair. Well, chef, you've been very generous with your time and I appreciate it very much. We will have links to everything that chef Chris now is doing underneath this episode on pardon my fork.com. Always good to talk to you. Great to see you at the WFC here a couple of weeks ago. And I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Yeah, absolutely. It's always great to be on the show and it really gets my mind going. I'm going to be thinking about our conversation now till the next time we speak. So thank you so much for the inspiration, brother. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. It's always good to get a chef's perspective on this stuff. You know that? Yeah, I definitely want to raise my glass to Chris. Chris now has done a good job. Tonight we are drinking a squash beer. Mm -hmm. It is a Autumn Harvest Imperial Pumpkin Ale. By Rubens Brews in Seattle, Washington. Yes. And this beer has a good pumpkin flavor. You know, I think with your pumpkin beers, you're going to either get a lot of spice and not much pumpkin. So you're just more drinking like a spiced beer. Or you're going to get a beer that's all pumpkin, like all squashy and not a lot of spice. What do you think about this? 
This has definitely got a really good balance. I was very impressed with this beer. As a matter of fact, I'm wishing Koi was here to try it because mm-hmm. I'd be interested to see what his thoughts are on it. But I definitely think it's got a pumpkin pie thing going on and not just the pumpkin pie spice. I mean, you can taste that there's pumpkin puree brewed right into it. Right. And I like that and I appreciate it. So uh, cheers to them for doing an amazing job on this stuff. Yes. Shout out to Ruben's Brews. It's been good. It's I always really like to find a good pumpkin beer during pumpkin season. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a lot of fun and see how different breweries use this unique ingredient because brewing with squash, that's a unique ingredient. Very. It's a very unique ingredient. It's starchy. There's other sugars to deal with that you don't get in your normal grains that you're dealing with. It's it's different than other fruits. It's not like you're adding apples or cherries. Anything that's a you know really heavily fruity, sugary mm-hmm. product. So this there's sugars in the squash. You just have to access them. Well, you know, it's like Chef Chris now was saying. Eating just a raw pumpkin is Mm -hmm. a completely different experience from eating a roasted pumpkin because roasted pumpkin, those flavors are going to come out a little bit more. You're bringing you're bringing the sugars out a little more. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just there's something happening. Speaking of, we have friends that are dairy free and, you know, we've had to be creative for cooking for people with allergies. And one thing a lot of folks miss is a cheese sauce. And you can make a really awesome cheese sauce using pumpkin and parsnips. Mm -hmm. And so just for folks out there, you know, I like to do uh, equal parts of pumpkin and parsnips and you can roast them or boil them and then you puree them and it gives a nice creamy nutty sauce. So if you think of like cheddar, what are the components of cheddar that you think if you break down the flavors? There's a nuttiness and there's a little bit of a, a spice. There's a little bit of an acidic quality. Mm-hmm. So I like to add a little bit of mustard powder you know, just a teaspoon of mustard powder and then go from there. You don't want it to become an overpowering spice and smoked paprika. And then I like to use coconut milk because then it's a completely dairy free product. Mm -hmm. And then to get the cheesy, yeasty, fermenty, funky flavor that you get from all cheeses, I use nutritional yeast. Mm -hmm. And nutritional yeast, I usually use about a tablespoon and then go from taste from there. And then that's a nice alternative cheesy like sauce look it's not cheddar it's not cheese and if you have folks that are extremely sensitive to dairy um this will it'll probably fill a void in their life where they've been missing out on a cheese sauce Mm -hmm. and it's great poured on broccoli and you know what it is it's just squash and root vegetables parsnips have a nice sweet nuttiness that you don't get from potatoes that you don't get from rutabagas it doesn't have that sulfur peppery bite that turnips have or radishes so i think it's a great alternative and it's not that carrot flavor so Mm -hmm. i don't feel like you're trying to really mask it too much it just adds a nice starchiness and then the pumpkin is so creamy you could definitely use butternut squash as well I was about to say butternut squash. As a matter of fact, any of those squash that are a little bit more, I don't, I don't necessarily know that I should be calling them mainstream, but, but they're the ones that people really think of when they think of autumn squash. They're the most common because, you know, they're the most delicate. They're, they're meat inside is both soft and flavorful. Mm -hmm. It's not too woody. You know, it's all Mm -hmm. of those things, right? And so butternut squash is a perfect one. I'm glad you brought that up because we've also made a butternut squash sauce to go over pasta before. Mm -hmm. And it was literally just uh, butternut squash that Mm -hmm. was roasted and onions and a little garlic and, you know, your seasonings and spices and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then that all goes in the Vitamix with the only brand of coconut milk I ever use, which is so delicious because it's a local brand. It is, and it doesn't taste coconutty. Yeah. If you get the unsweetened, just natural, uh, I think it's with the green label, mm-hmm. it doesn't taste like, no, you know, it doesn't have a bad flavor. I'm not saying it has a bad flavor, but it, but it doesn't taste like coconut like mm-hmm. a lot of the other ones do. Yeah. Other store brands are really coconutty. Mm-hmm. And so if you, we have plenty of friends where they just don't like the flavor of coconut. 
So it's kind of a challenge. And I love to cook for people. And I love that like sleeper status when I present a meal to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're kind of into sleeper cars. I'm sort of into sleeper (laughs) meals. If I can say, oh, hey, this is made with coconut milk, they never would have tried it. But I mean, let's just think about this. Butternut squash has been cultivated and used in cuisine in America for 10,000 years. Right. Central and Northern America has been using butternut squash for 10,000 years. And if you just think about like summer squash, it's only been about 500 years that we've been actively using that in cuisine, that it's been bred and cultivated and, you know, they've done selective breeding just to get like really good squash that we see in the grocery stores now. But and can I say that's something that I found very interesting is squash has the unique ability to be cross bred and cross pollinated very quickly and easily. Mm-hmm. And so new varietals almost crop up yearly. Well, and pumpkins and like Hubbard squash, the big mm-hmm. gray giant squash, those only been around for 400 years. Mm-hmm. This, so it's really not that much older than a, the United mm-hmm. States. And is it because, is it because the plants are, is the correct term self-pollinating because they have both male and female f- flowers? Yeah. I mean, they're wild. There, there was definitely a wild form that were really bitter and inedible. And then humans, through, <laughs> I guess, process of elimination. Mm-hmm. Did they die when they ate it? Well, then don't eat that. They found the good <laughs> ones. They also, you know, looked at what animals were eating. Mammoths were eating squash around the same time that humans started eating squash. And so what did a mammoth eat? Uh, but, you know, the last mammoth died, what, 10,000 years ago? It's also around the time squash became domesticated mm-hmm. and utilized by Native American populations. But I think definitely humans are going, oh, hey, this one tastes really good. I'm going to save the seeds mm-hmm. and I'm going to grow it. You know, one of the first signs of a domesticated culture is the harvesting of plants and, you know, saving the seeds and cultivating them for next year. That's a really big sign of domestication of a group. So, And I would say it's arguably easier to do with pumpkins and squash than a lot of their vegetables. You know, do you know, The domestication also might be directly related to what they wanted. Did they want a gourd with a hard rind that they could then Mm -hmm. dry and use for storage? Or did they want something with a thin edible rind? So it just depends on what that particular population was going for as they domesticated that crop. Well, and that's a really good point because let's go back to cooking inside of a pumpkin or inside of a Mm -hmm. gourd just real quick. Imagine you're growing something that you can hollow out, you can cook a soup in, a stew in, you can cook a chunk of meat in, Mm -hmm. right? You can set it directly into the coals of fire. You can set it off to the side of a fire. It literally has its own vessel that it can contain itself within. Yeah, with a thick, like, woody skin. Exactly. And then as you start to serve out of it, you're scraping the sides, like (laughs) Mm -hmm. Chef Chris now was talking Mm -hmm. about, and you're getting bits of the pumpkin as well as whatever else you cooked in it. I mean, the versatility of the pumpkin or or just the squash or the gourd in general to a, a people that didn't even have clay pots at the time, mm-hmm. we, we assume. They had something like that. But mm-hmm. yeah, as, as, it, as clay pots developed and as their agriculture developed, then they're going to learn how to breed crops differently. Being able to cook a whole meal inside of something that you grew that you then eat, mm-hmm. that would that would be something that my prehistoric brain would be looking for every time. The other thing to remember is these are directly related to the pollinators that are around. Right. Squash require pollinators, bees. So as different native bee populations have developed in different cultures and different countries, that's also going to impact how that squash develops. Because if there's a particular bee that is reliant on the squash pollen, you know, it becomes a symbiotic relationship. So that's also the thing to look at anybody that's into entomology and how bee populations developed and how um, pollinators are tied to different agricultural products. That's an, a really interesting relationship to look at. Huh. I hadn't thought about that. There's a bee in Central America, like around Peru, called the gourd bee. And there's a relationship between the development of domestic squash and this bee population Hmm. just depends on the archaeological evidence that they've found no kidding just like with figs figs are are 
definitely dependent on a specific variety of wasps. Bees and squash have a very important connection. And so do humans. You know, if we don't take care of our bees, then we aren't going to have pumpkin pie. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. So it's just, it's another thing to tell people if you have gardens, plant pollinator friendly flowers around your squash because it will attract the pollinators that you need. So you have a healthy crop and amazing Thanksgiving. And, you know, I do think we should talk for just a second about the plants that grow the squash because every piece, every little bit of those plants is 100% edible. Yeah, but squash leaves aren't that delicious. They aren't, but what about squash blossoms? Mm-hmm. Mm. Totally love squash blossoms. Right. Have you ever had squash blossoms that are filled with ricotta and deep fried? You know I have because you've made them for me before. Yes. And there we had a neighbor when we lived in Portland, um, our buddy Isaac, his mama, straight out of Central America. She would take all the squash blossoms, chop them up and make this special quesadilla. Mm -hmm. She didn't use cheddar. I don't know what kind of cheese she used. It was some kind of Mexican cheese, but you only had it in the spring and it was a squash blossom quesadilla. It was so good. It was so labor intensive, but it was so good. Who even comes up with something like that? And it's such a specific time of the of the season that you're able to make something like that. Huh? But it was so good. It was so good, but it goes back to your seasonal cooking. You know, you eat with what you have. Some of the greatest inventions, like, I don't know, chicken wings, comes out of poverty. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Where would we be if we didn't have chicken wings, right? Yeah. I mean, 8,000 years ago in Oaxaca, Mexico, somebody decided, hmm, I'm really hungry. I don't want to wait for pumpkins. I'm going to eat the blossoms now and stuff it with cheese. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Brilliant. Back to cultivation, there's the the term that people have heard called three sisters, where you plant companion plants, plants that are supportive of each other. Corn, beans, and squash are like the three sisters for a lot of South American, Central American farmers. The corn grows tall and provides a trellis for green beans to grow on. And the squash grows along the ground and the leaves keep the ground protected and helps retain moisture. And then all of those are products that can be stored for months, long into the cold winter. They can have a really nutritious food supply. I mean, once you pick your pumpkins and your squash, if you store them in a cool, dry place, they'll last three or four months. Yeah. If you dry corn, you have a nice good food source, calorie source, vitamin source, well into the fall, well into the winter. And the same thing for beans, you can dry those. So, you know, these these crops were developed not only for the immediate food source, but also for their storage capacities. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. You know, you want it, you want a food source that's reliable, that's easy to grow, that you can store well, and that has multiple uses. And I think squash really fills all of that. You can use it dried as a container. You can serve it whole. You can turn it into a lot of different products. And then also you store well for the times when it's lean and you're hungry and make beer. <laughs> and make delicious beer. <laughs> make delicious beer. Yeah, super good. You know, this has been a really fascinating week. Learning how versatile and how underappreciated, in my opinion, now that I've looked into it. Yeah. Squash, pumpkins, all all of our gourds mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really amazed by them, and to be honest with you, it makes me want to start cooking with them more. Yeah, well, you know, that's the the whole goal that we're trying with this new season is to focus on seasonal ingredients, locally grown, and just diving deep into it. It's a simple ingredient, but there's so much you can do with it. And there's so much history around it. I mean, how much of the Native American cultures in Central and South America have been influenced by their ability to cultivate squash? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a summer squash or a winter squash. As we approach Thanksgiving, you know, what was the relationship between the Native Americans, the European settlers, and squash? Who knows? It would, I guarantee you it was on the table. I guarantee mm -hmm. you they ate it. Whether it was this big, fancy Thanksgiving meal or just hanging out around a campfire, there was probably some sort of squash involved in that meal. Yeah, there had to have been. And man, I need to make, I need to make like a 
rice pilaf stuffing inside of a pumpkin now. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Oh my gosh, great minds think alike. Okay, I was totally thinking like a wild rice stuffing with like, you know, pine nuts, celery, onions, sage, and put it inside a pumpkin and bake it. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh my gosh, we're so married. (laughs) Great (laughs) minds think alike. Do you think your parents would eat it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, definitely. We should do that. I look forward to doing that. We we did a few different squash meals this week, even yeah. though Corianne was on the tail end of the flu and I was just starting to catch the flu. Because I'm a good wife and I share everything. Yes, dear. Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. You took such good care of me and then I infected you with my virus. Well, you did grow some really amazing squash out there. And one of the yeah. Kaboka squash that we had picked and it was actually for a salad that you make using kale out of our garden as well another winter crop yes by the way if it doesn't snow 10 feet where you are you can have kale all year round right and it doesn't taste that bad grow it yourself it's very good actually i think kale tastes better once there's been a frost yeah it's sweeter Mm -hmm. i think so Interesting. So anyway, yeah, our kale salad. This salad was created by my close friend, Christina, who's a vegetarian. And it's kale, apples from our tree, squash from our garden, nuts and seeds. So to get all of your amino acids, we did hemp hearts and pumpkin seeds. And that way we get all of our amino acid profiles. So we're not lacking any nutrients. And then we've got fresh shredded apples, thin sliced onions, and it's just kale. You can use a mixture of kale and something else if kale is too much for you straight. And then a tahini dressing. And there's lots of different recipes out there. This one's basic. It's equal parts tahini, olive oil, and vinegar. And there's some mustard in there, but, and lots of lemon juice. So I just find it's a delicious combination. And the squash gives a nice heartiness to it. Mm -hmm. It really helps round out the flavors. And a little bit of sweetness too, Mm -hmm. because those nice, delicate squash Mm -hmm. have just that bit of sweetness after you roast them. Mm -hmm. But of course, we had plenty of that squash left. And so when Monday rolled around and I hadn't full blown gotten sick yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. I decided that we need to have a meatloaf Monday and I went ahead and I fine chopped almost as a matter of fact, I would say minced, but mm-hmm. I added it into my mix into my meatloaf. Mm-hmm. And so it had onions and it had the squash in it and all of my seasonings, spices, cremini mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, mm-hmm. a couple of duck eggs. I was telling Chef Chris now about it. You heard that earlier in the show, but I have to swing back through on so it because it was, delicious. man, it was crazy good. It was like a meal mm-hmm. in and of itself. I mm-hmm. had almost as much veg as I did meat in the meatloaf and yeah. it just turned into this meal in and of itself. It's really kind of a homestyle meatloaf. It's, mm-hmm. it's not your classic old fashioned mama's meatloaf. Oh, and I smoked it over oak, apple and cherry for color. Oh yeah. Meatloaf's always smoked here. There's no point in even doing it in the oven. Why even bother? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, hey, going back to the 10 feet of snow thing, but. <laughs> right. Right. It's super good. But smoked meatloaf is just it's the best. That's right. And I really enjoy throwing our signature ingredients into the meatloaf and seeing how we can mix it in there. Well, next week is going to be a doozy because next week we are doing hazelnut. Hazelnuts. So I hope you guys at home are tuning in for that. And I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into the underrated and unappreciated squash. I want to thank you, Corianne, for helping me out with this. You're welcome. Cheers. Happy to be here. Cheers with our squash beverage. That's right. And I want to thank you guys at home for tuning in. I want to thank you for telling a friend. And I also want to thank our fine sponsors over at Gem City Fine Foods, gluten-free and nut-free, dedicated gluten-free and nut-free bakery. They have got a pumpkin cheesecake and a pumpkin pie that are both two die for you guys have got to go and check them out over at gemcityfinefoods.com we also want to thank our fine sponsors over at Fluger's Bacon it's the bacon we used at the World Food Championships hun. everybody loved it Suzanne Duplantis we ended up leaving her with a package of it because she was just like attached to it she was married to it she loved that bacon so much it's the best bacon she's ever had it's the best bacon 
you've ever had, mm -hmm. make sure you go and find some of that over at Flukers with an S dot com. And of course, GBX Custom Cookers, who put together our trailer smoker. They're doing lots of cool stuff over there. Check them out on Facebook at GBX Custom Cookers. And while you're checking those guys out, make sure to check us out at Pardon My Fork on the Instagram and on the Facebook. Ironically, I had been locked out of my Facebook this week. You were in jail. I was in jail and I didn't even know it because I had the flu and so I wasn't really feeling up for uh, social media stuff. And then when I got back on, Facebook is like, oh, by the way, you still have 24 hours in Facebook jail. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're done with that. We're We're moving on. Everything is good to go. And make sure you are checking those out, please. And thank you. I just want to shout out as you plan your Thanksgiving meal coming up, if you know you're having people coming over for dinner that have food allergies, I totally encourage you to check out Gem City Fine Foods because they have gluten-free, dairy-free, nut-free, soy-free products. They can be ma mailed to your door frozen. So you just take them out the day of Thanksgiving. They'll be thawed and ready if you have someone that really can't eat whatever you're serving for your normal dessert. There are lots of options. It will make them very happy. Also, if you don't know what to get somebody as a holiday gift, Get them a frozen cheesecake. Good Lord, it'll make anybody happy. Again, go to Gem City Fine Foods. It's a really great option for all of your holiday events coming up this year. We cannot rave about them enough. No, nope, and could not agree more. So I want to thank them. I want to thank you, Corianne. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Chef Chris Now for coming on to give his two cents. And for Corianne and Chef Chris Now, this is Andy, and we will see you next time. Oh.